Bob Kagan, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you. Great to be here. Um, I'm keen to talk about a really interesting essay you wrote recently about uh, Donald Trump and the domestic uh, political situation in the United States. But I want to open uh, by talking a little bit about the your core field of study of international relations. Um, with uh, Russia's assault on Ukraine, we've gotten a little bit of a primer about uh, different approaches uh, to uh, foreign policy, in part because of a debate uh, about John Mearsheimer. So uh, we've had uh, you know, a primer in sort of 101 uh, international relations theory between uh, liberals and realists and neoconservatives. Uh, my understanding is that uh, for you often called a neoconservative, you, you don't exactly fit into any of those views. Can you give me a sort of, where do you anchor yourself in these theories and, 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 and what is sort of wrong with the most traditional reading of, of each of those traditions on, of thinking about foreign policy or international relations? Uh, well, it's a, that's a good question, and obviously categories are always problematic. Um, I, I wouldn't know what to, to call myself because I think that my own views are grounded in realism in the sense that I, I think that power is a critical determinant of international affairs and political affairs, and that if, if you don't recognize the sort of comparative power structure of the international system, you're not going to understand why nations are doing what they're doing. But where I think uh, I part from people who are self-described realists is in believing that issues of belief, faith, uh, um, ideas, ideology, the way people live and the way they want to live is at least as much of a powerful interest as any of the more tangible things that, that, that realists tend to focus on, that human beings are fundamentally concerned with how they are gonna live their life. And these foreign policy questions have Im implicate that. So when people look at what Vladimir Putin's doing, I think people are, are, are scared that maybe ultimately this, this could mean if, it, if unchecked sort of the end of, of, of liberal existence. So, uh, so I think that that is a, powerful source of what human beings want and what nations want, because nations, of course, are just, uh, you know, collectives of human beings. The, the, the problem I have with realism is they think that nations, the nation state has a separate set of interests, a sort of a, a special club of nation state interests, which are different from what the people in those nations want. And I think that's just, that's just wrong and, uh, and misleading. So um, to caricature a little bit, I guess uh, a hardcore realist might say you can understand most of the lines of conflict that are likely to arise and you can to some extent predict what kind of conflicts could happen in the future just by looking at structural features of geopolitics, just by looking right. at what is the geographical layout of different countries which might make some of them vulnerable to each other in particular ways what is their relative military might, what is their relative economic might, which helps to predict their military strength in various ways, what kind of weapons do they have? And that's sort of enough on a simplified model to learn a lot about the world. And so um, I guess is your pushback that um, this assumes that states are all alike and that they all uh, pursue the same kind of interests and you need to know more about the ideology of a state? Or is it that actually we need to disaggregate the state as an actor and look at how different uh, forces within each state are competing for power, for influence, or for their preferences? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think both of those things are true, but, I, but I'm glad you brought up the latter because, of course, no, no nation is, is a unified collective. Every nation is a, is a collection of competing interests. And foreign policy is either set by one of those interests because it's become dominant, for instance, in a monarchy, that it's the kings that are guiding the national interest. Um, whereas in democracies, obviously, there is a, there's kind of a more shared uh, kind of a competition for control of foreign policy and uh, people who are, whose uh, interests clash domestically often have clashing foreign policy views as well. And we see that today where, you know, a lot of conservatives up until the invasion of Ukraine found themselves very sympathetic to Putin, seeing him as a strong, anti-liberal, Christian, 
uh, a leader who somehow stood for the kind of nationalism that some conservatives would like to see in America, uh, which by the way was also true in the 1930s when conservatives in general were far more worried about communism than about fascism and by default really were even sometimes sympathetic to fascists. So all of those factors and on, you know, you could say the same thing on the liberal side, the liberals were more worried about fascism than they were about communism. So they were inclined to be soft on the Soviet Union, but hard on Nazi Germany, et cetera. So, uh, you, you know, you can't understand certainly in a democracy what the outcome of a foreign policy debate is unless you understand how much, especially for the United States, how much of that foreign policy debate is actually rooted in a domestic debate. Yeah, and one of the interesting things within a democracy is that obviously elections turn in part, perhaps not primarily, on the different foreign policy visions of different candidates. And certainly we normally have the impression that whether we end up electing Donald Trump or Joe Biden or Bernie Sanders as president of the United States is going to have an influence on how the United States acts in the world. And that seems to go against some of the most fundamental uh, assumptions of a realist IR tradition. Right. Again, I think that I think uh, uh, unfortunately, realism comes from a need of 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 the social sciences to find something that they can measure and quantify, and so they create the idea of a nation state having tangible interests um, that you can measure, and that's and that is what and because that's what you can measure, that's all you measure, and so you you wind up neglecting you know the whole human aspect of international relations um, and the effect of domestic political situations on, on, on nations' foreign policies. Um, so I, I think we've sort of covered the theory of it really well. I, I want to understand some of the implications for how that should make us think about the world. One of the interesting arguments you've made that is to some extent in tension with realist tradition is about how the United States has actually uh, shaped what the world looks like over the last 70 or so years. Um, uh, you know, a, a realist might think that the relative peace that we have managed to keep in the world since the end of World War II has to do with structural features of great power competition during the Cold War period or for kind of unilateral hegemon in the decades after 1989. Um, but, but your explanation uh, puts a little bit more emphasis on, on the nature of American power, if I understand that right. Can you talk us through that? Well, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of things. Uh, one that is sort of in, in the realist framework is I think that for whatever reason, realists uh, tend to cling to a multipolar model of international relations. I think if you if you if you scratch them, you you would find that their ideal circumstance is sort of uh, the Congress of Vienna and the, and the few years following the Congress of Vienna, where you had aristocratic diplomats getting together and sort of arranging a balance of power or codifying a balance of power. And there's a kind of moralism to the realist position, which suggests that the only just world is a world in which multiple powers are balanced against each other. Otherwise you have hegemony and domination. Um, the problem I think- I in that a little bit about that because it's not obvious, you're just a realist just claiming to be an analyst. It's not clear why you should have a normative position. And yeah. it's not clear, I think at first sight, why it is that uh, a possibly precarious balance of power between all of these different countries that are similar in strength should be bad at keeping the peace than a situation in which um, one country dominates or a situation in which perhaps two countries are really powerful and they've somehow struck a deal and they can threaten each other with nuclear annihilation. So where does this attraction to something like a Congress of Vienna moment come from within uh, that framework? Well, I, I, you know, that, that we would have to delve into the histories and psychologies of all these different intellectuals. You know, why does Henry Kissinger, you know, Henry Kissinger wrote a book called The World, A World Restored which was, was his, I suppose, his PhD dissertation in which he discusses at great length the Congress of Vienna and how you got to it. And it, but it's pretty clear, and if you read biographies of Kissinger, it's pretty clear that for him, that is the ideal situation. And, and from that, um, he and other realists derive the idea that you definitely can't let ideology get in the way of this, of this sort of, uh, uh, you know, relatively allegedly stable balance of power that, that exists. You know, you had countries that didn't necessarily agree, like Britain, and Austria didn't share 
political uh, ideological perspectives, but they shared a desire to maintain that balance. Uh, I think realists, and if you go back and read Hans Morgenthau, their greatest fear is of uh, Napoleon. Napoleon is the great is the great disaster, if you want to carry this metaphor or this historical analogy forward. He's a disaster because he had universalist pretensions. So they are highly suspicious of all universalist pretensions. And in their view, communism and liberal democracy were in a sense equally messianic and therefore equally likely to lead the world to destruction. They didn't, they didn't think that because the United States was a democracy, it was necessarily better for world peace than the Soviet Union was because of communism. So, um, and so, you know, that, that leads them to miss a lot of things. And I think the thing that they most miss, although I'm, when you talk about realists, of course, there's 5 million realists and they have 5 million different points of view. So it's a little bit, I don't wanna overgeneralize, but I think what they miss is the success of the American order for lack of a better term is based in part on one thing that they never could, that they were never able to predict and didn't really believe in, which as you say, is the possibility of a unilateral hegemon in the world. Uh, they don't have a theoretical construct to support that because it's not a theory. It's just a reality of geography and wealth and power, et cetera. Um, but, but it has turned out, and some people have written about this, it had turned out to be a very stable situation as, 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 you, as you mentioned. But then they also leave out the, a, a key element of that stability is that uh, those within the American security umbrella, those who are willing participants in the American led liberal order are themselves liberals. And that's, that's critical because they don't believe that however powerful the United States might be, and in power terms alone, Europeans from the beginning should have been frightened of the United States. It was much more powerful than they all were. But instead, they sort of welcomed and even invited American power. And I think that's because of ideological affinity. They knew that American power does not threaten their fundamental freedoms, whereas other, the, the rise of other great powers who don't share these liberal values would threaten, in, inherently threaten their liberal values. So you do need to put the sort of unique circumstances of American power together with the unusual because it is historically unusual fact that you have a universalist liberal democracy that also happens to be the global hegemon. And that those, those two things together create a highly unique set of circumstances, which you can't replicate really in any other way. So in a way it's anti-theory, if, if you know what I mean. There is no theory of how you get to a country or a situation like this. It just happened as a, as a series of historical accidents. But, but it is a powerful force, nevertheless, as we've seen. So I, I, I think there's one obvious response to that that many listeners will, will give, and I'd love to hear uh, you respond to that in turn, which is, well, uh, but what about all of the ways in which the United States has used naked power, uh, often in uh, morally dubious ways, um, since 1945 and before that as well? What about... Uh, the Monroe Doctrine, uh, what about uh, America's uh, control of, uh, you know, the Americas, what about um, the Vietnam War, what about the invasion of Iraq? Um, so so I, I guess, why is it that we should think America's ideology has played such a role during those decades? Or to put it a little bit differently, what might the world have looked like uh, during the period in which America had tremendous power up to 1989 and during a few decades in which it was a kind of unilateral hegemon after 1989, um, if America hadn't been a democracy, in what ways would things have been worse? Well, they would have been worse if you believe in democracy. If you don't believe in democracy, they would have been better. Um, so, you know, uh, <laughs> it, it kind of depends on where you sit. But I think we understand, and, and the interesting thing about the Putin uh, invasion of Ukraine is that I think it kind of reaffirms this. There is, the, the question is always in the case of American power or any other uh, leader of a world order, the question is not only what are the bad things that have happened and been done in the name of hegemony or what have you, the question is, what is the actual alternative? Because no one, no sensible person would claim that the United States has behaved 
either flawlessly or with perfect morality or with perfect consistency. I mean, we are subject to hypocrisy uh, and bad decisions and even immoral decisions like all other human beings are. But the question is really, if you don't have the United States in this position, what are you likely to have instead? And I think that there is this tendency, or at least there was this tendency uh, to, to feel that, well, you would, have a, you would have a nice kind of multipolar stable world in which the United States wasn't throwing all its weight around, but basically you'd have a diverse international environment in which people would nevertheless find a way to work things out. And that has to be the assumption because otherwise you would not say, I'd rather have uh, 30 years of global conflict instead of American hegemony. I'm not sure, other, unless you were in Moscow or Beijing or Tehran, I don't know whether you would be likely to make that, that choice. So, um, so I think what we have seen, if you, if you really look at now the period leading up to the era of American hegemony, which is to say leading up to World War II, and now looking at what has happened potentially as a result of either the end of that hegemony or an inadequate or a sort of lessening of that hegemony, it seems like it's pretty clear that the alternative is not uh, finding a new stable uh, order, but rather, uh, you know, quite aggressive leaders and, uh, you know, taking quite aggressive and violent actions uh, to, to reshape things. And that you're not, you know, you're not going to get um, you know, some wonderful 18th century monarch as your alternative, you're going to get Mussolini, Stalin, Hitler, Mao, Xi Jinping, Vladimir Putin. And I think once you, once you realize that those are the actual choices in the modern era, in the, in the era in which we live, I think it throws in somewhat starker relief uh, the fact that American hegemony for all its many flaws uh, is still a better is still a better situation uh, than the absence of it in the real world, not in the world of our imaginations. And so this gets to the brilliant title of your last uh, book, "The Jungle Grows Back." Um, uh, you've always had a way with words. What does it mean for the jungle to grow back? Um, and is, is is the war in Ukraine an, an obvious example of of the jungle growing back? Yeah, I mean, the, the premise of, of that phrase and, and, and the short book uh, of which it's a title is that what has been created this, this rather sort of historically remarkable liberal democratic order that has been largely at peace in terms of great power conflict um, is not, as I think people might have thought at one time, certainly in the 1990s, this idea was prevalent that it was somehow a product of the evolution of the human species, that, that you know, it was a kind of teleological view uh, of progress and uh, that, we, that the world had reached a new plateau somehow as a product of what have you. It's a classic enlightenment liberal perspective that, you know, the on the and, marching and, and on- I'm simplify, but Stephen Pinker, who's been on this podcast, right. um, uh, represents probably the, the most sophisticated version of that claim, right? That if, over if time, you say so, be less and less violence over, over the course of yeah. human history, uh, but as people become more educated, more affluent, uh, yeah. there are better conflict resolution mechanisms, we have more to lose and all of these other kinds of mechanisms which might right. uh, make us believe as people have believed in one form or, or another since the 18th century, uh, yeah. that we are gradually progressing towards greater human sociability and peace. Right. Right, and the thing that I always found amusing about Pinker's analysis and also the, the Yale law professors who wrote their book about uh, the Kellogg-Briand Pact, I don't know whether, uh, what, I don't remember what their names are, but um, the, the, the great thing about this, this, this new progress that they cite is that they all start counting in 1945. Well, what is it about 1945 that has sent the world toward a period. Of, so we're we supposed to believe that in 1938, when enlightenment principles were practically dead, uh, and they certainly were not heading toward their obvious triumph. But then in 1945, those ideas suddenly emerged as the dominant ideas. I would suggest that probably it's really what happened in terms of the power relationships in the world and what had happened as a result of World War II that 
that created this more peaceful world and which allowed fewer opportunities for conflict and killing, um, not that suddenly enlightenment ideas, which had been uh, having no discernible impact on anybody in the 1930s were suddenly the dominant view. So I just think that everybody, a lot of these people want to leave the United States out of that equation because then they would have to admit that the United States for in whatever way actually improved the status of the world. And that is an impermissible thought. Um, so how does that change? Excuse me. Um, how does that change how we should actually uh, act in the world. So if we accept that uh, the jungle is growing back, uh, that different countries, different leaders of countries have generally different preferences. We can't assume as some neoconservatives might that everybody is just yearning for liberty. And so therefore we are uh, gradually uh, moving uh, towards that order. If only we give people the opportunity to govern themselves democratically. If uh, the sort of optimism drawn from a certain strain of enlightenment thought, which says, as we're becoming more affluent, more educated, things are just going to get better. If all of that is untrue, what does that imply for how the United States uh, and how other democracies should act in the world? Uh, right. And, and I, let me just say, that is, that is not a neoconservative position. That is a classic American, and you might even say Western liberal enlightenment view. I mean, this idea, and we've had it, you know, it's been, as you mentioned, uh, we period, Americans and others periodically believe that we have reached this level of progress and they believed it uh, in a couple of years before World War I, right? I mean, uh, there was the famous book by Norman Angel explaining how war had become obsolete for all kinds of reasons. And so we, we periodically recur to that. And I think it's just a, it's a, it's not a neoconservative thing or a liberal thing. It's, a, it's just our enlightenment heritage to a large extent. Uh, but the answer of what to do if we know that that is not true um, is to understand that the very nature of the international system means that there, as it happens, there are dissatisfied powers who do not feel happy in the liberal world order, even if they, to some extent, benefited from it. I mean, China is a great beneficiary of the American-led world order. It's been great for China's security. Uh, it's been great for China's, which has allowed China to focus on its economy. So it's been a beneficiary. But of course, the world was not shaped for China. And so it's not un unusual, even if it may be unwise, for China to want to reshape the world uh, in such a way that it is shaped for China, which essentially means, among other things, that China exercises hegemony uh, throughout East Asia. So what we need to do is understand that those are natural forces. That is the jungle that's always trying to grow back and that it requires the exercise of power in all in, in a variety of forms, not just military power, but economic power and political power and diplomatic power to keep those forces in check as, as we have successfully done for quite some time. And as we could have done with Putin too, in my opinion. Uh, but you know, we, are, we have our own psychological, Americans have their own psychological uh, hangups about how they feel about the world, which we can discuss uh, either now or at some greater uh, at some time at greater length, but, but the fact is uh, we are very reticent in general about taking any action uh, that has not been sort of forced upon us by an external event. So, you know, we, we in a way don't even recognize that our great power is affecting the way other countries behave. And so we're not ready for their response. Whereas if we were more conscious of the role that we're playing then we, we, I think we would have the capacity to be more conscious of what is necessary to, to reduce conflict. The problem is, is that we, uh, Americans in general, begin with the prejudice that nothing out there in the world really can affect us or will really hurt us. Um, and there is a certain truth to that, by the way. Uh, but what we don't realize is that there are things in the world that when they happen, we won't, we, we, we find them frightening and intolerable. And we're right, because a shift in the global balance of power away from liberalism and toward autocracy would be, uh, you know, uh, would be damaging and, and, and worrying for us. So we're not wrong to do that. But 
but we never think that that's what we're in the business of doing. So in a certain sense, I would say, Americans do a lot of, spend a lot of time deceiving themselves about what they need to do and what they want to do, only to find themselves then doing it, usually in the most disadvantageous situation possible, if, if that makes sense. But that we're always late. Um, if you look at the history of World War I and World War II, we're always late. We've always been able to eventually accomplish what needs to be accomplished, but at a much higher price than if we had been engaged all along. So but, but, but I'm still not quite sure that I understand what that means concretely for how yeah. the United States should think about a strategy in international relations in the next decade. So how for that matter, Germany or France or the United Kingdom yeah. should think about their strategy. So again, to caricature and simplify a little bit, uh, at least one strain of realist thought is going to say, look, uh, the United States is now rivaled economically by China. Uh, it is in certain limited ways rivaled militarily by, by Russia, at least in so far as nuclear capability is concerned. Uh, and that seems quite scary, but perhaps it's actually a good thing because we'll get back to a kind of new Congress of Vienna, a new balance of power. Um, now we can try and negotiate that order to be uh, as uh, close to our interests as possible, um, you know, perhaps it is possible to somehow make sure that Ukrainians can choose uh, their own fate freely. Perhaps that's not possible, but at least we can defend, you know, Poland and the Baltics. There's sort of questions about how exactly the world is going to be cut up. But if it, ultimately, we just have to accept that there's spheres of influence and our sphere of influence is going to be significant but limited and Russia will have theirs and China will have theirs and we sit around a table and make deals and that's just the way it's going to work, right? Um, no. You're saying, no, that's, that's a mistake because the jungle is going to grow back and this is going to have these really bad consequences um, for the world, these really bad consequences for how we can live domestically. So, uh, so what are those bad consequences and what's the alternative in terms of how we should act instead? Right, well, I mean, it's always been a key element of, of again, self-described realist thought that the United States is always too weak to accomplish anything other than accepting a balance of power. Henry Kissinger started predicting that the United States would have to share in a multipolar world because it didn't have the capacity to remain the hegemon. He started predicting that in the 1960s. Um, and Paul Kennedy predicted it in, you know, 198, you know, right before the fall of the Soviet Union. And, and we've constantly been told that the United States doesn't have the capacity uh, to do these things. And I think that one of the interesting uh, sort of developments of the, as a result of the Putin's invasion of Ukraine, is that we actually sort of have seen how potent the liberal world order still is. I, I have to say, even I, I have to admit to some surprise myself, because after the Trump years and really even after the Obama years, um, it was reasonable to assume that the, the sort of the American sort of security structure and alliance system had really frayed and that countries were having real doubts about whether the other countries were having real doubts about whether the United States was still in the game, et cetera. But the response to the invasion of Ukraine has, has really been remarkable in that regard. Uh, the degree of unanimity among the democratic allies and the degree to which the democratic allies all have looked to the United States to provide the essential leadership militarily, but also in terms of organizing the economic response uh, is sort of proof uh, that, that this is still, the United States still wields enormous influence in the international system together with this great democratic alliance uh, system that it's created. And I would bet, I, I, I can't be sure of this and you never know what's in Xi Jinping's head, but I'm sure he's been given pause uh, by the degree of the global uh, response to, to Putin's actions in Ukraine. Now, that doesn't mean that if Putin, if Putin does wind up succeeding in Ukraine, we are going to, um, to answer your question, we will then be facing a Russia. Ukraine is critical to Russia's existence as a great power. If you look at, if you look at the map, uh, a Russia that does not have Ukraine is almost by definition of second rank uh, power, even in Europe. It's, it's barely in Europe. And so we need to understand that. And if at the same time, we have China uh, preparing to make a move in the South China Sea or against Taiwan, um, then that is gonna be, you know, that, that, that will also have enormous implications uh, for the region. So 
the short one thing that you mentioned when people talk about spheres of interest it's, it's very good to talk about spheres of interest unless you're the countries who live in that sphere of interest so what people are really talking about if they're honest is consigning japan korea uh southeast asia and and who knows who else to jap to chinese domination you know and uh, which will have all if they accept it which is a question mark uh, if they accept it, it will have all kinds of internal implications for Japanese politics, so and or Korean politics or, or Australian politics for that matter. Um, so again, I, I fear that when people talk about these things, especially realists, they posit a kind of smooth transition in which these countries just acquire their spheres of interest. And somehow there are no victims that we have to worry about. And there are no dangers that are the consequence of that. And I just think that is a very ahistorical view. Uh, I think we should understand where Chinese ambitions ultimately lead. And I'm not even one who thinks their ambition is to run the world. I think their ambition is to return to hegemony in their region, but that has massive global implications. And are we really ready for that? Uh, similarly, if we allow Russia to sort of restore, restore its Soviet era position, that has all kinds of ramifications. So, you know, on the one hand, we do have the capacity to deal with this, but on the other hand, if we fail to deal with it, we will be getting close to the point where we may not have the capacity to deal with it. Um, one of your famous phrases is that Americans are from Mars and Europeans are from Venus. Um, in the last weeks with a relatively robust European response, at least at the time of recording this, to the crisis in Ukraine, uh, with the pledge by uh, the new chancellor of Germany, Olaf Scholz, to spend at least 2% of the country's GDP on the military, uh, with European leadership uh, on sanctions towards Russia. Some people have been suggesting that there is a sudden uh, re-emergence, which nobody had really calculated with or thought about, of uh, Europe as not just a big economic power, but a kind of military and geopolitical superpower. Um, do you believe that there is going to be that kind of turnaround or uh, are uh, the factors which have made the United States much more willing to enforce its vision of the world and its interests uh, with military means in the last decades when Europeans uh, going to continue to shape the next decades such that uh, I, I assume the implication would be uh, actually uh, uh, what we're seeing from Europe at the moment is perhaps more an aberration than the new normal and the country will return to a kind of reluctance uh, to, to use its military, to invest in its military, uh, to be very active geopolitically on the world stage. Well, I, look, as I say, I'm, I'm certainly heartened by what, uh, what has happened in Europe. And, and, and of course, in the, the German shift is the most striking. Um, it's being driven ultimately by fear, uh, which is what normally drives these things. And, and it's perfectly true that until this day, really, until Putin launched this invasion, one of the things that, that basically supported Europe's general Pacific approach was their perception that they had nothing to worry about. I mean, that there really was no, there certainly was no threat on the European continent that they had to worry about. And, uh, you know, threats that are beyond the European continent are mostly beyond their capability anyway. So uh, it, it, what we've seen in, uh, because of uh, Putin's actions is a genuine return to the kind of fears uh, that I think Europe hasn't really felt very much, it, maybe at certain moments of the, at the height of the Cold War, but other than that, not since World War II. So, you know, we are in that situation. Now, is Europe going to become a military superpower? I would be very surprised to see that. We are still talking about a multinational organization. We're still talking about, with, and with Britain out, you know, it used to be that the engine of European security uh, anyway was, was, you know, Germany, France, and Britain. Uh, right now, Germany is a dominant power. France is a secondary power with very little influence on Germany. Anyway, I don't see, you know, in this moment of crisis, we're seeing more European unity, but I don't really foresee uh, much as I would like to. I've always thought it would be the best possible option for Europe to become another geopolitical superpower. I would trust Europe as a geopolitical superpower, but they are not, I don't think they're going to go quite that far. But 
but we may have seen a real and 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 for good reason a real shift in European views as to whether there is a threat out there that they have to worry about. Until this day, I think they would have said fundamentally no. So speaking of threats uh, that we have to worry about, I want to turn to the domestic political situation and a much discussed essay of yours that you wrote after and reflecting on uh, January 6th when you saw it on the Capitol, arguing that the United States is now headed uh, for, for a genuine uh, and in, in its form unprecedented constitutional crisis, uh, perhaps in 2024 or perhaps briefly thereafter. Um, what makes you so worried uh, 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 about the American domestic political scene right now? Well, I, I, I actually wrote that article before we learned um, much about what had happened on January 6th, and we certainly hadn't gotten the detail that the January 6th investigating committee has opened up about what Trump was trying to do and the various memoirs that have come out. So I'm actually more, you know, there's more reason to be concerned now than there was when I wrote that. But what I, what I was basically getting at was, uh, first of all, when you have the overwhelming majority of one political party either actually believing or pretending to believe that the last election about which there has been no question <laughs> of its legitimacy was in fact a fraud, that itself is a constitutional crisis. And when you add to that, that um, from the point of view of the people who feel that way, the only problem in the last election was that they didn't have their people that they could trust, counting the votes, announcing the votes, sending alternative slates in if necessary, et cetera. They have now set about uh, since then uh, to replace all those, to replace as many of those people as possible. States have taken steps to, to grant legislatures increasing power to overturn the decision of uh, the electoral count that has been produced by election officials. Um, there are all kinds of ways in which we are preparing uh, for a 2024 election that is contested. And even a contested election is enough to throw the United States into a constitutional crisis because and literally so, because you know the Constitution doesn't have an answer to this problem. Um, what one of the things we've learned since Trump took power, uh, and since Trump uh, left power, even, is that you know a lot of the a lot of what I think Americans thought were sort of or automatic structures in the system that that spring into place whenever there's a threat to it. It turns out that it there there aren't any such things that the founders for a variety of reasons, we're not able to establish a foolproof, me foolproof method of preventing uh, dictatorship through this means. And therefore it's really up to people. It's up to individuals in and, and all the way up and down, all the way across society, everybody from the president, the vice president, the Supreme Court, uh, the members of Congress, down to uh, you know volunteer election officials, you know? So, uh, those are the people, in a way, who saved us in 2020. Um, and unfortunately, those are the, you know, I, I don't know that there is a legal or constitutional fix uh, to what ails us. And so uh, what I most worry about is moving into a period where, let's say, two or three states which hold the balance in the Electoral College are completely contested. There is every prospect of mass protests from both sides. Uh, people are increasingly tending to come to those protests heavily armed. Um, we've already, you know, seen uh, pe uh, people with weapons showing up at protests and shooting people and then being exonerated afterwards, perhaps justifiably exonerated, but it certainly sends quite a strong message. So we could be in a situation uh, in 2024 where there is no obvious way out and then we'll be left with a President Biden or, or whoever is in charge at that time, having to sort of make what amount to extra constitutional decisions in order to save the democracy because there is no constitutional remedy. And I think, so that's, that's what that, I Explain that idea in a little bit more detail. What would it mean to have to resort to extra constitutional measures to guarantee the constitution? Why, why, why might that become necessary? 
Well, I'm always I'm always brought back to this uh, wonderful speech that um, Daniel Day Lewis gives in Lincoln, which I don't think we think that Lincoln necessarily said, but which was brilliantly written by the by the screenwriters, in which he explains how the Southern secession basically threw him into a constitutional no man's land. There was no, you know, when he made decisions about freeing the slaves or he made decisions about how to treat uh, a secession if he didn't want to admit that they were another country, uh, all the complexities that came from that, he's very frank, and I'm sure in his own mind, in reality, he was also very frank in understanding that he was charting his own course at that point. So if you're, if you're a president in a situation where you are like hopelessly deadlocked in a couple of states because you've got mobs in the street, and how do you get out of that situation? You know, at what point are you able to say, no, uh, I won or they won or somebody won and that's the end of it. Um, you know, is he going to call out the National Guard? Is he going to call out the army? There are all kinds of, you know, once you have gotten to the point where the sort of established means of choosing a president and all that comes with that have been uh, thrown uh, uh, to the, you know, to, to the winds, uh, you really are in, a, in an extra constitutional situation. And that, by the way, means that whatever a president does in that situation, the other side will accuse them of being a tyrant um, and, and just the way Lincoln was accused of being a tyrant and, and to some extent justifiably so. So that, that's, that's really what, you know, yes, I don't want Donald Trump to be president after 2024. I don't want him to be president even if he's legitimately elected because I think he will then dismantle American democracy because he doesn't have any belief in American democracy. But even before you would get to Trump being in office, you would be in this crisis where we do not have a legitimate president. <laughs> that, that, that's what I'm worried about. So let's think about two different aspects of this. I think one question yeah. is how likely are we to end up in that existential uh, crisis or that constitutional crisis in 2024? And another question is what set of factors uh, would need to be in place for the danger to pass in a more lasting way. So let's focus on the first part of that to start off with. Um, uh, the argument that you're making, and I've made a similar uh, argument in the past, basically I think boils down to three propositions, which is uh, one, uh, that it's uh, quite likely that Donald Trump or uh, somebody who is similarly willing to subvert free and fair elections is going to be uh, the Republican nominee, uh, two, uh, that uh, if they should lose, um, they will uh, try and put pressure on local elected officials to subvert the certification of uh, the election in a place like Arizona, for example, or perhaps a place like Georgia in an even more extreme way uh, than they did in 2020 and that they may have uh, uh, a real chance uh, in succeeding uh, with that, um, uh, and free, that there is then no real easy remedy uh, to ensure uh, that Donald Trump uh, or another similar candidate doesn't uh, uh, get seated as president, or at least doesn't uh, is in a position to convince a very large percentage of the U.S. population that he should be legitimately seated as president. Um, I guess the only so I guess is there anything in the uh, last months uh, that has made these scenarios more or less likely than when we all first started discussing this topic and you wrote so so well about it. I suppose, uh, to be cynical, uh, the only factor I can think of which has made that scenario less likely is that Joe Biden is less popular than he was and he's more lastingly unpopular than he was and so perhaps we're spared all of that uh, because uh, the Republican candidate wins fair and square. But as you pointed out, uh, that then creates, when the other shoe drops of what would somebody like Donald Trump do in, in his second term in office. Right. And I mean, I think the first thing that I want to say, which is, I think, relevant to all of those questions uh, and your points, is that I do think Donald Trump is special. Um, I, I personally will not be able to forgive Republicans who permit, you know, who, who made it possible for Donald Trump to be Donald Trump and, and who have been so cowardly in confronting him ever since. But I would be happy to, I mean, I, the, uh, 
comparatively speaking, I would be happy to have any one of them running for office rather than Donald Trump, because I do think that Donald Trump's relationship with the movement, uh, the Trump movement, if you will, or whatever it would be, whatever you want to call it, is unique. Um, I think in the absence of Trump, the movement itself is likely to uh, splinter, because I don't think there's anybody who has the particular type of charisma that Trump brings that these people find so attractive. We could discuss what that charisma is, but I think that Trump is unique in that respect and no one else. And I think in the absence of Trump, you probably have three or four pretenders to the throne and probably things divide up. So for me, Trump, Trump not getting the nomination should be everyone's first goal. Um, and, you know, but un unfortunately I'm not, convinced that there is any way to stop him from getting the nomination. Now, the, the things that you would said, is there anything about the last few months? I mean, if, if you talk to, I won't call them anti-Trump Republicans, but, so far, but let's just call them non-Trump Republicans, uh, they are trying to convince themselves that Trump is finished. You know, maybe he, the, the candidate he picked, you know, maybe picking Mo Brooks was a disaster. You know, his candidates are not necessarily winning. His influence may be waning, they believe. Um, DeSant, you know, DeSantis it seems to be making a good play for at least some big portion uh, of the Trump constituency. Um, and so their, their view is that we don't have to worry about Trump, ultimately, that, that he's losing influence in the party. I, 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 I must say, I think this is the wrong time to be asking that question, because right now, he is de facto laying low. He's not announcing that he's running. He, he's off all the big megaphones. By the way, I mean, you tell me whether these, uh, whether these uh, various social media platforms are going to be able to deny uh, the right of a presidential candidate to, to be on their sites. You know what I mean? That, that's going to be a very interesting and difficult call. So I, I think he's likely to get his megaphone back after the 2022 elections. If it's a Republican Senate and Congress, um, I suppose in theory they could go their own way. But I think everything we've seen so far indicates that they will go the way the Trump movement wants them to go. Um, and then if we then as we start getting into the primary season, I would have to be persuaded that Trump isn't going to get at least a majority of primary voters, you know, I, Right now, I would say he would get the overwhelming majority. But even in a even if we're being pessimistic on Trump's behalf, are you really telling me there are candidates out there who are going to get more than Trump is going to get on average in a primary vote? So all these things that people are saying could be true, and he still winds up with the nomination. And if Trump is the nominee, then then all bets are off. Um, whether he could then win legitimately, or whether he could then lose it and then try to steal the election, you know, all those things are going to be on the board. So. Um, Unless someone can assure me that he's not going to be the nominee, I really have no reason to feel any more comfortable now than when I wrote the piece, you know, you know, six, eight months ago. He's favored. Again, it's not a likely outcome, um, but it is more likely than the alternative outcomes, according to predicted, uh, to be elected president in, in 2024. Um, uh, I mean, the question is, I don't know whether you were going to ask this question, but the question is, has the foreign, have the, have the foreign policy events potentially put a dent in Trump's position. And the only reason that you might, one might be optimistic about that is that that is the one place, that is the one, Russia and Ukraine are the one issue, I'm sure you've been following this, where Democrats and Republicans basically have the same view. Uh, there is not nearly the kind of huge gap that there is on every other issue. It's very clear that Trump was wrong, wrong footed himself by praising Putin uh, in the early phase of the election, he had to go, he had to some extent scamper back from that. Um, and I, if I were uh, running against him, either as a Democrat or a Republican, I would say, look, forget about what you think about, you know, maybe Donald Trump is the right president for certain times, but he's not the right president for this time. Do you really wanna have that guy with his finger on the button? Do you really want that guy making decisions about how we should deal with Vladimir Putin? Uh, I, I, I would like to believe that there is a certain segment of the Republican electorate, maybe it's the suburban Republican electorate, whatever, however you want to put it, that might feel that maybe Trump is not the right guy for this kind of world. And, and even on the Biden question, I think Biden's poll numbers have gone up a little bit. Um, there is a little bit of a, 
people call it a post state of the union bounce, but I would call it a post invasion bounce. And, and I think that, you know, foreign policy is always one area where a president, if, 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 if he or she handles it correctly, uh, has an opportunity to galvanize some support in the nation because of a national emergency. So, uh, and the only other thing I would say is, you know, as you know, uh, 2024 might as well be a hundred years from now in political terms. There's so many things that are gonna happen between now and then. Um, but I do wonder whether this foreign policy dimension is potentially changing a little bit of dynamic. Um, so let me turn to the second part of the question, which is what would have to happen, uh, not just for America to somehow get past the acute danger in 2024, uh, but for this broader moment of real danger to pass. Now, it strikes me that in a way, uh, your answer to that might be a little bit more hopeful than mine. I've been worrying about the rise of populism more broadly and some of the structural features that have fueled it. Um, and so uh, while I certainly recognize that Donald Trump is a uniquely dangerous individual and uh, I think has a much deeper emotional and effective bond with his supporters than a replacement would, uh, and personality and charisma certainly matter. We see that in the deterioration, for example, of the Venezuelan regime, which was able to sustain some amount of domestic legitimacy under Chavez, which it completely lost when Maduro took over. Um, you know, I nevertheless worry uh, that there are broader uh, tendencies here which are going to outlive Trump and that in fact drive Trump and Fox News themselves to some extent. We saw that, for example, when Trump uh, recently made positive comments about the vaccines and perhaps the boosters, I forget the exact context, and was booed by the audience. Um, uh, so, uh, so I guess I am a little bit skeptical that if, let's say, Donald Trump had a heart attack and passed away uh, next month, uh, uh, that would really make the danger pass. Whereas you seem to have a slightly more personalistic interpretation of, of Trump's ability to present this danger. And that might imply that if only we can somehow outlast Trump, and Trump of course is not a young man, um, uh, or perhaps if we can definitively beat him in 2024, uh, uh, that the danger might pass more rapidly. So what, what, what do you think it would take for the acute danger uh, to pass, not just in 2024, but let's say in 2028, 2032, uh, et cetera? I mean, look, that, that is the most important question and it's also a very difficult question to answer. So let me just, let me just throw a few things out in response to it. One is, uh, there's no question that there, was a condition, that there are conditions in the United States in terms of the way people feel about things, the way people behave, what they value and what they don't value that, that that is a problem that exists apart from Donald Trump. And, and the question then is, has it always existed? Um, is there something new about what we're seeing today? Um, I think there's a reasonable case to be made that certainly race, racism is not new in America. White anxiety is not new in America. Um, we've, we've had terrible moments of, you know, if you go back to the we never think about this really because we think about the, 19, the roaring 1920s, but the 1920s were a very similar period uh, to what we've been going through right after, right after the, the, the election of uh, Harding, because what you had then was intense xenophobia, intense anti-immigration, anti-science, right? We had the, you had the Scopes trial, you had the rise of the, the second rise of the second clan, uh, you know, to much greater numbers than it ever had before. Uh, on top of the isolationism, they, they all went together, anti-free trade, et cetera. I, I would say, you know, we, these, these, these tendencies have, I think, always existed and are uh, sort of inherent, unfortunately, to the American experience. Um, you might ask why in the 1930s, uh, the 1930s were a time that was ripe for a Donald Trump and the Donald Trumps were out there. You know, Father Coughlin was out there. Huey Long was out there. Um, the difference, I think, was that the, the nominating process was such a, you know, smoke-filled room, backroom negotiation that they were never going to let the, any of those people get the nomination. And I think one of the consequences of the democratization of Republican primary system, something the Democrats, by the way, cured themselves of to some extent after the McGovern election, uh, after, the, after 1972, 
Um, I think the democratization gave an opportunity for someone like Trump to get into where he would never have been allowed in by the party structures. But, but all of which is to say, I just, these problems that we that currently exist are not going away. The question is, can anyone galvanize that movement in the same way that Trump does? And I'm just, uh, for whatever, and you know, if you look at history, there were any number of thousands and thousands of Germans who agreed with almost everything that Hitler said, but they weren't Hitler, you know? And I do think at some times people, you know, individuals come along that make a huge difference, you know? Um, again, Stalin didn't bring anything particularly new to, uh, to communism other than his personality and his style. Uh, so, I guess I feel like almost everybody else out there is some version of a more traditional pop, uh, politician. Like Ted Cruz says a lot of outrageous things, but he, he even Ted Cruz is not Donald Trump. Um, I don't want Ted Cruz. I think Ted Cruz is a disaster. I would rather have almost anybody in the world president than Ted Cruz. <coughs> but I don't fear Ted Cruz the way I fear Donald Trump. Now, maybe this is just irrational on my part. Um, maybe it's too much wishful thinking, although I don't usually consider myself a wishful person, but, um, but I, I do think he's special. Um, and as to these other problems that exist independently of Trump, I mean, we do need to work on them and we need to fight that battle. And that, by the way, that battle now, as we can see, needs to be fought again at every level of society. You know, you have to fight it at the school board. You have to fight it in the local community center. I mean, this, we are in one of those moments where uh, we can't just wait for our elected officials to solve everything for us. But, but I do think, I guess, you know, to repeat myself for the umpteenth time, I do think that Trump is special. And so I do think if we can get past Trump, yes, we have a chance that this group that has always been around will be out there simmering, bubbling, occasionally giving rise to some politician's uh, trajectory but not the kind of comprehensive threat that Trump has turned it into. Rob Kagan, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you. I enjoyed it.